note this evidence. First of all, my declarations of interest. I'm a trustee and chair of the European Association for Obesity. I'm a trustee and governor of the BNF. I get research grant income from BBSRC, the European Commission, with several grants, and from NIH. Industrial support from Novo Nordis, Swimming World, and the Almond Board. And conference support from the Royal Society, IFR, European Association, Swiss, Austrian, Mondelez, Masterfoods, Novo, LC, and the European Forum on Evidence-Based Prevention. And I show these just in case anybody might think that what I'm going to say is in return for favors bestowed or in return for large sums of money. Sad to say nobody's offered me any money at all to say what I'm going to say. So it's entirely my own views and my own opinions. But um, food addiction has been in use for several decades. And normally it's been used to indicate strong preferences and food habits. And certain publications over the years have indicated an interest in that and nothing more. These publications and others like them indicate that certain people might show rather greedy and extravagant eating behavior, which is termed an addiction in the same way that we might refer to people who play golf a lot as golf addicts or tea drinkers as tea addicts or TV watchers as TV addicts. And it doesn't go any further than that. However, the landscape's changing, and that term has now been given a new interpretation. Food addiction now is being regarded as having the same properties as addiction to hard drugs. Uh, and this view is characterized by strong language and motive claims, the use of extreme slogans such as sweetness is like cocaine, sugar is the new tobacco. The question is, is this healthy? And is it justified? And is food addiction needed to explain obesity? So now we're seeing headlines and titles such as this, Evidence for Sugar Addiction, Behavioral and Neurochemical Effects, Food Addiction, Fat, Rewiring the Brain Like Hard Drugs, and the Dopamine Involved in Addiction Like Reward and Compulsive Eating in Rats, Sweetness is More Powerful Than Cocaine as a Reinforcer or Reward, Food Addiction similar brain activity to drug addiction and the toxic truth about sugar as an addictive substance. Sugar has been likened to tobacco or cocaine. One influential publication which you may know is this book by David Kessler, who was a former Surgeon General in the United States, and it probably has the most inappropriate title of any book I've ever seen. The End of Overeating would be nice, but Mission Impossible. What he introduced was this term. I get rid of that. Before. Uh, never mind. Hyperpalatability was a neologism that came into existence with this book. And I'll come back to that a little bit later in my introductory comments. And others will refer to it later in the afternoon. So the food addiction landscape is like this. The mild use of the term has been around for a long time, just indicating strong preference, repeated behavior, regular, and repeated activities of a certain nature. But now the proposition has come about that human beings' relationship with food is similar to a person's relationship with drugs of addiction, such as cocaine, opiates, tobacco, and alcohol. And this shifts the severity and shifts the nature of the term food addiction quite a lot, gives it a totally different meaning. What's involved in this? People show a compulsive tendency to seek and consume foods, and they respond negatively when the foods are not available. They, in other words, show substance dependence. You eat something, it's taken away, you show withdrawal symptoms. And some people, therefore, it is alleged, show characteristics that could lead them to be identified as food addict. They behave like drug addicts with a different target. So it's alleged that food addiction, I'm being patient, addictive foods, causes overconsumption and obesity. The question is whether obese people are addicts with characteristics similar to addicts on hard drugs. These are the nature of the allegations which are currently being expressed. So the central issue, one central issue, is that obesity results from an addiction to food. 
and this addiction to food strongly resembles addiction to drugs, behaviorally and neurochemically. One reflection on this is that the language constitutes a form of medicalization and pathologization of a normal social behavior. And it makes a, a clinical condition out of common eating behavior. This eating behavior, therefore, takes on the properties of a disease. And when you use extreme clinical medical language like this to describe a behavior, it alters the way in which people view their own behavior, reduces the dignity of that behavior, and reduces the change of the way in which people view their own lives in relation to that behavior. The question is, is it helpful? And is it justified? What's our agenda? Well, this symposium is not about denying the idea of food addiction itself. The concept is plausible and it could occur. However, it shouldn't be, in my view, likely assumed that it exists or that it's widespread or that it can account for the epidemic of obesity. The consequences of accepting food addiction are quite far-reaching. So we feel that a dialogue is needed about the term. I'm not based on exchange of slogans, but on analysis of the scientific evidence. Some of the background that's led up to the current situation uh, comes from these four domains. First of all, animal studies, in which certain foods and the specific conditions have been said to alter brain chemistry in ways similar to hard drugs, and drugs of addiction. Human evidence from PET scanning, which suggests that the basis for drive of food occurs because of the desire for people to boost their own reward chemistry. And some foods change brain activity. These are called addictive foods. So the hypotheses refer to people themselves who are addicts and to foods which carry some addictive potential. And there's a test that we'll hear about later called the Euro Food Addiction Scale, which claims to identify food addicts. Now, if you look at that quartet of proposals there, uh, and everything is true, then it really adds up to a powerful package. The question of it, how much is true, how much of it is believable. Uh, in my view, there's no conclusive evidence for any of those four propositions there, no matter how strongly they've been stated. What is known? Well, we know that the brain contains pathways that subserve reward, and foods that we consume stimulate these pathways. And the fact that foods do that, that forms the basis for us learning about behavior that brings food into the body. It's a powerful mechanism for learning, and it's well known. Drugs of abuse are intense molecules which, when consumed, go straight and directly to these mechanisms of reward, which actually, remember, subserve the function of indicating food is pleasurable. So these drugs go straight to that reward system and stimulate it intensely. And that's why they carry with them such intense pleasure. They're working on an evolutionary old reward system in the brain. It's been argued that later when it is found that foods happen to influence these same systems, they're working on systems that are responsible for drug addiction. And therefore, the foods are addictive. We actually need to reverse the steps in that logic. These systems in the brain are designed to tell us something about food. Hard drugs, drugs of addiction, exploit these mechanisms. It isn't the case that food is acting on mechanisms put in the brain to give us pleasure from drugs. It's the reverse. So the sequence in this logical argument needs to be considered. A certain amount of evidence has come from animal models and looking at the title of this, one's eye is drawn to the statement, evidence for sugar addiction. But if you take a different view, you will see that this comes from intermittent and excessive sugar intake. Now, there isn't time to review all of the animal evidence in this short introduction. I'm just going to make some remarks that characterize studies carried out on animals. First of all, the animals are in control, non-stimulating environments. They're on strict feeding regimes normally, 12-hour deprivation. They have access to pure forms of the food, either sucrose or fat. There is obligatory consumption, large amounts, strict daily repetitions of this. And then repetitions are abruptly stopped, after which you measure the 
consequence of that in the animal's behavior. And you find something like this. Uh, here's a, a measure for change in mobility. The daily intermittent sucrose shows a big change in this measure, indicating that when the repetition stop, the materials are bluntly withdrawn, you get a big change in the animal's behavior. When the animal is eating normally from ad libitum food, including the, the substance, there's no change when the, the food is withdrawn. So it might be that this state of dependence and the withdrawal symptoms that follow the abrupt withdrawal are actually due to the regime itself and not due to the substance. Animals do respond badly when conditions in which they are kept are abruptly changed. And humans do too, by the way. So that, in my view, is an interesting phenomenon. It tells us something about animal behavior under certain conditions. It's quite dissimilar to human social behavior and human eating patterns. Uh, and my feeling is that any claims to relevance to human action really need to be made quite cautiously rather than recklessly. Because not only is this form of behavior and schedule control, repeated administration, abrupt withdrawal, hardly related to the animal's natural behavior, certainly a long way from human natural behavior. An influential report that appeared in The Lancet in 2001 stipulates that a form of addiction could come about because brains have insufficient chemicals that mediate that reward. Therefore, eating food increases the reward potential to the brain. So humans seek particular food because they don't have enough reward neurochemistry in their own brains. And this uh, chemical is dopamine. And you can see on the right here the relationship between the intensity of dopamine receptors in the brain and BMI. It's worth noting straight away that this BMI scale is quite high. The smallest person with a BMI of 42 and the largest person BMI of 60. So this is, these 10 people are quite a, an unusual population. But as you can see, there's a relationship between the intensity of the dopamine receptors and obesity. So where there's low intensity to the dopamine receptors, there is a lot of obesity. However, one might say, well, what happens in lean subjects? And there's no control group here. But later, in a publication published in 2005, we see that a control group has been added. Now, if you look on this axis here, which is the intensity, the density of these dopamine receptors, you find that there's the same density in control subjects as there is in obese subjects, which rather undermines the idea that this receptor density is responsible for changes in BMI. There's a contradictory report as well. And I've always found it rather ambiguous and incongruous that one can speak about a loss of reward in the brain being responsible for addiction. There's an alternative hypothesis, which is that brains have an excessive reward in transmitters. And it's the excessive reward that drives people to seek foods that add to that transmission. So we have, on the one hand, a reward deficit hypothesis. People are eating because they've got too little reward in the brain and reward surfeit hypothesis. People are eating because of the excessive reward in the brain. Hypo or hyperactivity hypothesis. Is that a problem? That there are two quite contradictory hypotheses that are supposed to tell us about how the brain relates to addictive food behavior. It might not be because the brain is a complicated place and you might be able to construct some neurochemical hypothesis that is appropriate to both, but what's really needed is some debate about that, because they can't both be true. So what's not at stake here? I want to say what is not at stake, what we're not arguing about or discussing. What's not at stake is that food is a source of great pleasure, and some foods produce greater pleasure than other foods, and some people more than other people. Foods produce effects in the brain, no question about that, it's what they are designed to do, and it's obligatory. Foods can establish strong habits and preferences, and induce feelings of liking and wanting, and produce cravings. 
none of which constitute food addiction, but may constitute a reason for over-consuming. So this is not about whether or not foods give pleasure, or whether or not overconsumption of food leads to obesity. It's about whether you need an explanation on food addiction to account for that. And my own view is that you don't. We all have uh, explanations for why obesity occurs. In 15 seconds, I can tell you what mine is. Um, I don't want to say it's representative of everyone who's going to speak, but it's worth knowing. My view about overconsumption of food is that it reflects general overconsumption in our culture. We overconsume everything shoes, shirts, socks, trousers, ties. Everybody in this room is overconsuming something. That is, consuming, purchasing something in excess of need, including foods. This is part of the culture in which we exist. And our culture legitimizes this overconsumption and even promotes it for economic growth. So we don't need a special neurochemical theory of addiction to explain why people are overconsuming the planet. What we do need is an explanation why some people do it more than others, and why some people do it with food more than shoes. And there you need a psychobiological explanation. Now, I don't have any trouble accepting the idea that overconsumption of foods, high energy dense foods, contributes to weight gain and obesity. Not on its own, but alongside the epidemic levels of sedentariness that also exist. It's not doing it alone, it's doing it in conjunction with energy expenditure. So what's not at stake here is whether or not food consumption is responsible for overweight and obesity. What is at stake is whether you need an explanation based on addiction to account for that. There's some information lacking, and I mentioned earlier this book by David Kessler, in which a number of reports refer to addictive foods. Hyperpalatability, for example, has been invented to describe properties of foods alleged to be compelling. Milkshakes, chocolate chip cookies, pizza, and so on. There is actually no operational definition of hyperpalatability. So if we're going to use it, we don't actually know what it means. Probably there are 20 different explanations in this audience. So if this is going to be used in a meaningful way, and it's not a crazy idea, it could be plausible, but it needs an operational definition. This is the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And please don't try to read all of this, but do pay attention to the remarks up here, which ask people to rate in the last year the sorts of foods that they've had difficulty controlling. And the list is sweets like ice cream, chocolate, donuts, cookies, starches like white bread, rolls, pasta, rice, salty snacks like chips, fatty foods like steak, bacon, sugary drinks like sodas, and so on. In fact, it's almost everything except fruits and vegetables. So in principle, this Yale Food Addiction Scale can let people identify in the whole repertoire of foods those which are most responsible for their own patterns of consumption and their own compulsions to eat. However, later when you look at what these same authors are writing in subsequent publications, what they want to say is that the Food Addiction Scale is a report measuring eating behavior of high fat, high sugar foods. So they changed the connotation of the scale from one which can ask about foods in general to the scale actually measuring a particular group of foods. Now we'll hear a bit more about this later. And when we and Leeds have used the Food Addiction Scale and identified people who score highly, what they say is that the foods that they find most attractive and compelling are bread, potatoes, and pasta, not highly processed foods. And although most of you won't be aware of this, I actually gave a radio interview for BBC Radio Shropshire this morning, uh, which was quite an exciting event, in which certain ladies were interviewed by the anchor. And the anchor asked the, the ladies what foods they had difficulty controlling. And they said, Weetabix, Warburton's white bread, and chips were the top three, and then a few others. So it isn't necessarily the case that this addiction scale is going to identify 
particular highly processed foods which have a particular composition, we've got to be quite careful and understand what the scale is doing. There is a European perspective on this, which is um, based on the European project, which has reviewed the situation and talked to experts, asked the question, does food addiction exist? And don't read all of this, I'll just show you the conclusion. And the conclusion in this part of that review is that overeating can be viewed as food addiction in a small subgroup of obese individuals, which is rather less than the idea that it counts for the whole of obesity, and that all obese people are acting like drug addicts. In the last year, certain reviews and considerations have been made and written by people who have become aware that the situation is actually getting out of control. Some outrageous statements are being made, and they're getting put into the media, put into the press, unchecked, because our journalist colleagues do like to demonstrate a dramatic um, and eye-catching phenomena, phenomenon. So people have been aware that the situation might be raising too many alarm bells and might be too much of a concern. So reviews are now coming about in which people are settling down and asking how prevalent, really how truly prevalent is food addiction in the general population among the obese. And later we'll be hearing about this now landmark review uh, obesity in the brain, how convincing is the addiction model. One important thing to keep in mind concerning food addiction is the way in which the American Psychiatric Association describes disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. And this contains a description of all clinical disorders which can be diagnosed and used in particular categories. And this is revised every four and five years. It's important to note that the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, not approved food addiction as a diagnostic entity, even in its most severe form, despite the fact that many people tried to persuade the APA committee to put it into DSM-5. The committee have looked at the evidence and decided that the evidence does not support the idea that food addiction is a diagnosable clinical category. So, come back to our agenda. Uh, symposium is not about denying the idea of food addiction at all. The concept is plausible. What we want is an analysis of scientific evidence and with plausible, rational ideas. 